Welcome back, welcome back. Please find your seats. We're going to get the panel discussion started here in just a few moments. I would like to, I would like to introduce the panelists, but I think I'm going to leave that to our panel, panel moderator. So those, how many of you have been here in, in, uh, in the last two years? Last couple of years? Handful of folks. So some of you, so some of you will, recommend, will recognize Allison Sim. Those of you that don't recognize her yet, keep an eye on her. She's very good at what she does. I've learned a lot from her. Uh, last year, she taught a, a, she helped uh, teach a, a, a class on motivational interviewing and CBT and ACT with Dr. Bronnie Thompson, which was just fabulous. And so my brain has felt a little bit bigger and slightly tight ever since. So come on up, Allison Sim. Thank you very much. So I'd like to welcome our patient panel. And this is a lovely direction for a, a summit of practitioners to be taking, is to, um, to obviously include the people who are most important to us, and those are our patients. So if I could introduce Mark on the right, Joletta and Erin. Take a seat, you guys. So the purpose of our panel today is, is not to necessarily hear the nuts and bolts of what each of these individual stories were. And I've had the, um, the pleasure of interviewing all of these lovely people and hearing their stories very thoroughly, so I, I understand their story. What we're going to do is give a very a rough synopsis of, of what they went through on their pain journey. Um, and where they're at now. And, but really what we're aiming to get to, get to in the panel is um, what were their thoughts and feelings about their journey? What things changed for them? So that's the areas that we're going to focus on today. So we'll start with you, Mark, if you're able to kick us off with uh, a synopsis of your, your pain journey. Um, it started in 2004 uh, with an injury, um, which turned out to be a very serious one. It was related to a disc that had uh, burst into my spine. It seeded the area, ultimately it became infected. I worked my way through that for quite a while and uh, thought I had rid myself of any uh, bacteria or anything that was related to an infection. And unfortunately, it came uh, roaring back in 2008. And uh, at that time, I underwent a very massive surgery for a spinal abscess from C4 to L1. I came out of that surgery as a very long surgery. And unfortunately, um, within a matter of two weeks, I was right back in with the same surgery, C4 to L1, because I had contracted a MRSA while I was in the hospital. And that put me down for the count. Uh, I almost died from it. And uh, it was a very difficult uh, process of just accepting and adapting, trying to just adapt to an entirely new life. I couldn't work any longer. Uh, I wasn't able to really function. And uh, I began to process, uh, focus within a couple of years on finding ways to uh, recapture my, uh, my control to something that could empower me. So I began looking for other tools and mechanisms and ways that I could learn about managing it. I accepted it. It wasn't going to magically go away. And so I've pursued uh, different solutions. I've incorporated them in my life and, and I manage well. Still difficult, but I do. Thank you, Mark. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's great. Joe later. Um, my pain started back in January of 2010 when I was working as a firefighter paramedic and I just stepped off the fire engine awkwardly on a routine call, felt a twinge in my hip and that twinge kind of led me down a path of progressively worsening pain and um, a number of therapeutic interventions through the workers' compensation system, an eventual surgery on my hip and then medical retirement. So. That led to kind of a dark period for me as well. Felt like I lost my identity, my sense of self-worth, my purpose, all of that kind of stuff. And then also tried to seek some ways out of that eventually. So after my medical retirement, I went back to graduate school and started 
studying human movement, um, but studied pain science as my research focus. And that kind of was what opened the door on me to be able to start to get better and to recover. And now, in 2018, it's the first time I'm kind of sitting from a perch of thinking, maybe I no longer have chronic pain. Like, maybe I'm through that process, and that is behind me. So that's where I'm at now. Erin. So I suffered from pelvic pain for about 10 years. So my first experience with pain, I was 19, um, living on my own in college, and had a stabbing shock of vulvar pain and had no idea what was going on. So that began a nearly 10-year journey of going to gynecologist after gynecologist and every other profession um, and being told that nothing was wrong with me um, until ultimately, I mean, I made it through college. Sometime in the middle of law school, I um, started using a wheelchair at times. I couldn't wear pants or underwear anymore. Um, we had to postpone our wedding. I made it through and graduated law school. Um, but wasn't able to take the bar exam right away. And ultimately, I saw about 12 PTs. I lost count of how many doctors. I had eight procedures done. Um, and ended up going to, we moved from Albuquerque, New Mexico, where we were living, to Chicago. Um, and I met a PT and a doctor who were able to help me. And um, I went from being in a wheelchair to about a month and a half later, I could walk a couple miles, and a couple months later, I went on vacation and could kayak and ride a bike, and um, that all began. So my pain was to 2004 to 2014, and finally, um, I stopped going to PT regularly in 2016. Um, I am adventurous, and so I still go back sometimes because I hurt myself, um, but I don't have chronic pain anymore um, and haven't for about, probably about two years. So. Um, that's sort of a weird thing to say after living with pain for 10 years, um, that moment when it's no longer what defines you, but that was my journey. Wonderful, thank you. Some very hopeful stories, and obviously they are very brief synopsises. I can tell you from having heard all three of their stories that there are some very dark times and, and very upsetting parts to these stories, um, but each of them has done quite well to overcome that and uh, to be living well either in the presence of pain or to, or to as Jo is starting to identify, to, that uh, she seems to have come through that. And hearing the stories, there's some very consistent themes that tend to come out. And one of those, particularly in all three stories here, is a sense of not being heard by practitioners and, uh, and the frustration and the loss of control that that creates. And I was just wondering, and, and we'll start with you, Mark, um, do you think do you think your story might have been different? Yours, yours is quite different to the others because there was a very clear mechanism. But do you think if there had been more time spent listening to you along that journey, that it might have changed things for you? Yeah, you know, my condition is easily identifiable. They just look down my back, there's a 20 inch scar, and it's, it's pretty obvious that I've had, you know, a serious uh, condition to deal with. I think in, in, in my case, uh, though it was um, more perhaps they didn't really know what to do. I mean, it was a big issue. It had dramatically affected my life. I could barely function. And so um, I'm, not, I'm not really sure that, that it was about so much them listening as it was they didn't really have a lot of answers. And so that's kind of where I started with it. Yeah, and do you think that, uh, that that sense of lack of direction, do you think that played into your understanding of how things were going? When I left the hospital, going into the hospital, I was active. I ran a business in San Diego throughout Southern California, actually. It was a, a fair-sized company. And, um, and when I walked out of the hospital, and I had no real reliance on medications other than perhaps a little anti-inflammatory. When I walked out, I had 14 medications. Most of it, the overwhelming number, I had no idea what they were for, what they did. But eventually, over time, initially I was just thinking about, I wasn't thinking about my life, I wasn't thinking about a career, I wasn't thinking about going back to work. I was thinking about, am I gonna make it through the end of the day? Am I gonna wake up tomorrow? Because I was, it was a high probability that I would succumb to the infection. So, so as time went on, those medications began to really affect my mind, my body. I didn't really know what to do. 
it was it was a real conundrum, something that I hadn't been in uh, in before. I didn't have direction, and so what happens is I began to slowly withdraw more and more and more, and when I would sit with the doctors, they didn't really have an answer, and over the course of a year and a half or so, I just finally reached a point of saying to myself, I couldn't live like this any longer, and I must find a way, because I wasn't getting a clear path. They hadn't developed what they have today in the way of pain classes, and actually entire departments dedicated to pain management. And so I began to research the medications that they had given me, and I was startled. I had no idea that some of the medications they had prescribed, well, the label says take for pain, had, in my mind, nothing to do with it. And I was having to deal with some of those effects and side effects of those medications, which really made it difficult. Mm, so that, that lack of direction made things, and, and a lack of understanding of what was going on and where things were heading were, were right. difficult. Each of the physicians yeah. had their own recipe, and so I was seeing a number of them, from the PCP to infectious disease and a whole number in between. And each would just pull their prescription pad out and write it or put it into the system and send me on my way. There wasn't a lot of dialogue. There was a lot of empathy. I felt that empathy. You know, boy, that's big. You know, you made it through. Not a lot of people could have done that, blah, blah, blah. But it wasn't really a direction on how you're going to return back to some life that resembled, you know, some normalities. You're not going to, there was none of that mm. until I began to explore it on my own because I just reached a point, I would forget what I was saying in mid-sentence. I would have the next word ready to come out and I couldn't remember what it was. Yeah. And that's difficult, that's isolated. So you really felt like you had to take, take things back into your own hands. Right. Thank you, um, okay. thank you for that, Mark. So for you, that I know that sense of frustration and that, that real sense of an invisible illness was, it was a big driver in your story. Can you speak a little bit about that to us? Yeah. Um, well, in, in for me too, it was it was a very disorienting experience because when my pain first started, like I was at the peak of my strength and my physical fitness. I was in a firefighter, which is a very male-dominated profession. Um, so I, I was used to always proving myself and you know working twice as hard to get an equal amount of respect. And to then have this pain, it was very um, it was a struggle on multiple levels because it it also affected my identity, how I identified myself and who I thought I was and my, my strength and my career and my profession were such a huge part of that. Um, so that was very distressing and very isolating because I also didn't feel like I could share that with anyone because that's not the culture of that profession and my own personal culture at that time too um, where you always so strength in the face of adversity and you're always the one that is answering the call for help and don't really know how to ask for help. Um, but what, what was interesting too in my journey was the, the most difficult thing for me to do was to sit. Like sitting was the most painful thing and I shared that with every clinician that I went to. They always focused on something else which was typically function and strength. Um, which in looking back didn't make much sense because I was really strong at that time, but we were always doing things like step ups and things to strengthen my hip and, and all of these things where my concern was not being able to sit because I needed to be able to sit, just to you know, be able to go out to dinner with my husband or to meet a friend for coffee or just sit on my couch and watch a movie and I wasn't able to do any of those things or sit on the fire engine to run calls. Um, and it was that, that inability that was preventing me to live my life and was never addressed. It was always kind of trivialized or just dismissed and, and never talked about. And then, and then you start to like internalize that. Like, well, maybe I'm just, you know, like it's me. Like this isn't that big of a deal, obviously. Like I should be able to just get over this and, and move on. And then you withdraw in further and just stop talking about it kind of all together. And I had very kind clinicians, I want to make that clear, and they were very empathetic and wanted to help, but I, I don't feel like they ever heard me and mm. what my true concerns were, and they just wanted to go into fixing the problem, which they conceptualized, as I did, as something being wrong with my hip. Mm. So everything was always focused on my hip rather than me or how the pain was affecting me and my entire life, you know, my career, my relationships, all of those sorts of things that that were much more important to me than just 
the hip, but that was our entire focus. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. And Erin, again, a story where, uh, again, an incredibly invisible illness and one where there were a, not a lot of answers. In fact, a lot of the time you were really seeking answers and never really finding those. Um, how, do you, how did that play into your experience, do you think? I mean, I echo like everything you just said. I absolutely felt like a lot of the clinicians I saw were very focused on what was, once I finally had a diagnosis of some kind, it was about getting my pain to zero out of 10. And after living in pain for years and years, my goal wasn't to live in zero out of 10 pain. I wanted to be able to sit just long enough to take the bar exam. I wanted to be able to walk just long enough to take my dog outside. So it was really about being able to function at a, an adequate enough level to live my life and reclaim my identity the way I wanted to live. It wasn't about just eliminating the pain. Um, and then in terms of not being heard, I too often felt like it was being missed that I was like a living, breathing person who coexisted with these symptoms. Um, and so a lot of my, I saw gynecologist after gynecologist and nobody, they do exams and say, oh, you're fine, nothing's wrong with you. So after suffering for several years, I finally found a YouTube video of a Dr. Oz <laughs> clip um, where he was interviewing somebody who was talking about a condition called vulvodynia. And I'm like, oh. Um, and so my husband was sleeping in the other room and I went like tearing through the house and woke him up. And I'm like, I have a word. I finally have a word for it. And so then I had that to hold on to and finally started seeing providers who at least had like heard of such a thing and believed vulva pain existed. Um, but it was still a really long process in terms of finding someone who heard what my experience was inside of like with that pain. So I, at one point, I read about it and saw the Vulvodynia often involved nerve pain and stuff, so I went and made an appointment with a neurologist. That seemed, I'm an attorney, I, you know, that seemed to make sense. Um, I was stressed out, I was in law school, um, an extraordinary amount of stress. And they ended up saying, well, you know, the stress and the weakness and the nerve pain, this kind of sounds like MS, so we're gonna do like an MRI, and I have an uncle with MS, and they're like, don't worry, the treatments have gotten much better. Like, this isn't like a life sentence. And so I was like sitting in my car afterwards shaking and in horrible distress. Um, and they didn't listen. Like, the problem is I can't wear underwear comfortably. <laughs> like, yes, of course I have like weakness and shakiness and stuff. I'm like, a second year law student who gets no sleep and I'm completely strung out with pain and the stressors of my life. So that experience was really emblematic of experiences I had time after time after time. And it just felt like they just weren't listening. They heard the symptoms, but they didn't hear who I was and the context in which they were occurring. So. Thank you. Um, and Mark, um, just moving on a little bit, again, a common theme uh, with the three of you is that you, at some point, usually in response to a level of information, and often that information was about what pain is and what pain isn't, you were able to take your health, take a bit of that control back and take your health care a bit more into your own hands. Now for you, Mark, that happened about a month before you actually hit uh, a care centre that was intended to help you do that. So you had already started to take that um, sense of control back, but what were those what were those bits of information that were really pivotal in helping you to take back control and and uh, set you on that journey to recovery? During the month previous prior to uh, enrolling in the classes and things like that, or the whole process? The, the whole process. So what, okay. what what helped to generate it for yourself, and then once you got into that system, what helped drive it further? So as I said earlier, I was taking numerous medications. I didn't understand their purpose. I didn't even know what they were. Once I reached that point of just living in a fog and not being productive, I, I, I had already accepted my condition. It, like I said, it wasn't going to just magically go away. So what I decided to do was I decided to engage myself in some kinds of projects that I had around my house. And I kind of stumbled inadvertently into what I later learned to be CBT, 
a form of it, where I was distracting my brain. And as I'm distracting my brain, I'm no longer focusing on the pain. While my endurance was very low, maybe 10 or 15 minutes, I find myself every morning getting up, putting my shoes on, going out, finding a project to engage in. While, while it may only be for 10 or 15 minutes, I feel better. I, don't, I haven't connected the dots because I don't understand what's happening. But I'm building my endurance. I'm finding myself engaged in something. And I'm beginning to feel less pain. The pain was there, I just wasn't focused on it. And then uh, I was referred over uh, to the pain clinic. Pain clinic had a number of providers, from a doctor and a psychologist to a PT therapist, a pharmacist. They were all focused on, on uh, managing chronic pain. And the real light bulb moment for me was when they began to discuss CBT, the cognitive behavioral part of it. It really made sense. I, I understood then that it's those my thoughts were con controlling my emotions, thus my actions, and then shaping my behaviors. And that was the light bulb moment for me. And I delved into it, I learned about it, I began practicing it, and it empowered me. It gave me back what I thought I had lost. Those sessions that I had experienced a lot of empathy, how could they not? Here's this man in front of them with this gigantic scar, and they know the, the case. It, it, it gave me back what I wasn't receiving from them. They didn't have the direction. And it just so happened that they, were, they had just opened up their pain clinic or the pain department, chronic pain department, and I was one of their first patients to enroll and be a part of it. Prior to that, just getting refilled medications was, was very difficult. They put their procedures above prescriptions, but people who have a, a reliance on those medications realize, I can't go two days without them. They've got too many serious side effects if you don't take them, and things like that. And along with that, I was also able to learn more with the pain pharmacist exactly what medications they had me on. When they give you antidepressants and the label says take for pain, you really begin to wonder what does that have to do with pain? Now they, they'll explain it and they'll say, well, we find, but I kind of felt like they were just doing kind of a CYA, just in case. And a lot of those medications were just in case, just in case this should occur. We've got you covered with a little prophylactic medicine here that, but it, the combination and the, and this, the sheer volume of them, well, just, it just brought me to a halt became very difficult to engage with people and communicate and have a, a, a you know, a, a conversation. Mm, yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. And for both of you girls, it was a, a timely person who came into your lives and for you a bit of information, Joe, as well, that, uh, that helped turn that story around. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, for, for me, after... So I was in the, the workers' compensation system for, for four years. And during that entire time, I had very, you know, tissue-based notions of what was going on in, in my hip and that it was structural and, or biomechanical in nature, that I was sitting wrong, moving wrong, doing all of these things wrong, which had to um, be the, it was the only explanation that I could figure out that was keeping me in pain. Um, that I was re-injuring myself like over and over again or that I'd messed up my surgery somehow and I was never you know um, Never given an alternative explanation for that It seemed to be a reinforced explanation with all of the therapists that I went to who also seemed to believe that my pain was in my hip and that it had to be structural and or alternatively all in my head and that there was nothing wrong with me so um, those were my only two options. Either there was nothing wrong with me or there was something structurally wrong and, with my hip. And at that point, Joe, you were incredibly highly functional too, weren't you? Like you were doing high level rehabilitation. Yeah. You know, the, your PTs were finding it hard to push you because you were, yeah. you were such a high achiever, but you were still having such high levels of pain yeah. and distress. I got an award for being a superstar at yeah. PT. <laughs> um, and this was after I was forced to medically retire. So I'm like, your idea of me being a superstar and my idea of being <laughs> And a superstar are two different ideas because I no longer have my career and my identity and my sense of self-worth but okay we'll go with it I'll take the picture for your newsletter um, uh, <laughs> I'm 
that, that's a little harsh, but um, it was harsh for me at the time too, though. Um, but at that time, I mean, I was doing step ups to the treatment table. You know, like I was strong. I was doing single leg squats on a BOSU ball with weights. Like, and I had a, a wonderful PT, incredibly kind, that she realized I was one of those patients that she had where she's like, there's got to be something else going on. Like, what I understand that causes pain is obviously not applicable to this person because I can't challenge her anymore. Like, I can't. I have come up with every exercise that can possibly come up with to challenge her, and she's not, um, she's not responding to that. So <laughs> through all that process, and then when I eventually medically retired and I went back to school, I started reading the work of, of Lorimer Mosley, and it, and it was like light bulbs were going off, and I was like, oh my gosh, like there's something else to this pain thing. And I, just reading the research felt very validated in my experience that like pain is complex. It's not just this simple thing. And it's not all just me. Like I am, I'm not the, the factor here that is um, you know, creating all of this pain or keeping me in pain. Like there's legitimate reasons why someone can have persistent pain long after tissues heal and things like that. Um, so reading the research really kind of opened my eyes to a different path forward. Like I started to realize that, that I didn't just have those two options where it's like all in my head or all in my hip. And I emailed Lorimer Mosley to see if he would let me interview him for a school project because I was in a master's program at the time. And somehow he said yes. And so I did a Skype interview with him. And, and at that time, I was still very much looking for my answer to my pain. Like, I wanted to know the reason that I had pain. And so I grilled him for like 45 minutes about pain science. And I'm, you know, really going to hone in on exactly what's happening. And I kind of learned through that process that that's not going to happen. That it was more about learning what pain wasn't um, instead of what it was. And then, and then feeling empowered to move forward and get back to my life without having to wait anymore. But like the clincher thing that he said, which I think is really cool. And, and kind of characterizes the whole perception shift for me was when I asked him like what the one thing people with chronic pain should know or to do to move forward and his answer was to love and be loved and it was it was mind-blowing for me and I was like oh like I'm thinking I'm thinking about the, my process all wrong where I was trying to fix the hip pain before I got on with my life and got back to engaging again with people and activities that were meaningful for me that I needed to engage with my life again and with the people and the places and the experiences that were meaningful to me and then then maybe the pain would start to be affected by that. So that was a huge turning point for yeah. me. Yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. Thank you. And for Erin, you were lucky enough to find the, the right therapist after your very long journey of seeing so many people who weren't quite the right fit and who didn't have the answers that you were looking for. You were lucky to find a team who, who did have yes. the answers. What, what were those answers? What did you take away from those sessions? So I spent years with people looking for the source of my pain. So either they said it was in my head, but not like in your head the way it's like actually in your head, like in my head, like I had invented this whole thing because this was somehow something anyone would want to invent. So they actually spent time like looking for it. So I was used to like, I have like no modesty anymore when I go to the doctor or like, like there's no, I get used to everyone wanting to look at it, to look at the pain, um, which like I grew up in a really conservative household, like that took some getting used to, but after years gone by, like, I could only wear skirts, I couldn't wear pants, I couldn't wear underwear. I live in Chicago, so there's like only a certain amount of modesty someone can have if you're like wearing skirts and no underwear all the time. So I got really used to everyone looking for my pain. Um, so I had tons of surgeries and all this stuff, and no one could find anything. So they were like, well, it, you know, have you seen a psychiatrist? And so I got used to that kind of, it's in your head. Um, and so finally I met a wonderful PT who introduced me to Lorimer Mosley's Explain Pain. And uh, this concept was entirely new to me, um, entirely new. So I had seen some fancy pants doctor in New York City years earlier. I'd flown out to see him and paid him like a couple thousand dollars for the privilege of spending an hour with him. 
And I had asked him at the time, because like when you, when you do that, you're like, you have your list of questions. And I'm like, is there nerve stuff going on? And he said, definitively not. There is no nerve stuff going on. This is only muscular. So again, back to like, okay, this is something they can fix. Um, and something they seem to be like obsessed with examining continuously to try to fix. So I finally meet a PT who on the first visit doesn't even do an internal assessment, which was like, wait, what? Um, and gives me Lorimer Mosley's explained pain. And I was like completely confused as to what was going on. Um, I didn't realize that this could be something over which I have some modicum of control um, and that I could start to gain control over by thinking about how I want my body to respond, um, how I want my body to respond to like fear and to apprehension and all this stuff. Um, and I'd say that the hardest thing about beginning to understand pain science was the tension between telling someone this is something that's not out of your control. This is something over which you have some control. And then the flip side of that, which was how I heard it from some other providers, which was, if I have some control over this, this must be my fault. Or I must have some ability to change this. So I had a doctor at one point tell me, it's all stress. He wrote stress on his notepad and circled it like 100 times and said, you just have to get your stress down. Um, and after the appointment, my husband was like, that's great. All you have to do is get your stress down. But I was like in tears because I obviously would have done that if like, it wasn't my actions, my behaviors, my life choices that had somehow inflicted this horrific experience on me. So I found that the way pain science was explained to me was somehow, I know you had asked like, what was the way it was done? And I actually don't even remember like, the delicate way it was woven into my treatment, um, which is probably a testament to how well done it was because it just made sense and was rolled out as I could handle it and absorb it um, and was integrated with tangible little things I could hold on to. Like, we just have to find some way for you to be comfortable. So that ended up being laying with a Franklin ball like under my belly button and that was good. Like, I could lay there without pain increasing. So it was about rolling pain science lessons in with tangible things I could hold on to so that it, it was not just a completely amorphous idea, but. Wonderful, <laughs> thank you, that's great. Um, Mark, you spoke beautifully the other day um, and I just wanted to see if we could get you to reiterate what you said to me. Uh, you talked about the idea of um, the analogy of a ruler and, and how what rule are you using to measure success? Can you talk to the audience a little bit about that? Because that really helped you to individualize your journey and define how you, how you were progressing. Right, it's something that I've been uh, working with my children on for years. And I tell them that the ruler in life, you must use your own ruler. If all of us had to go through life, for example, with Bill Gates's ruler and measure our success based on that, we might feel not so successful. So I have always encouraged them to use their own ruler, establish what that ruler is, and don't compare yourself to someone else when you're assessing your skill set or your abilities or anything along those lines. So I use that myself, where I accept my condition. I don't believe that there's a, a, a cure. I don't think it's going to just go away. I accept it. And that came in part from dealing with psychologists who helped me revert back to my own ruler. When I make an assessment of what my condition is and where I'm going to be, I'm going to do it based on my ruler, on what my abilities are, etc. One of the things that I learned and, and I believe and I would recommend to any provider is that if you spend some time with your patients in analyzing their commitment that will, pro that will help you probably understand their level of motivation and will probably help you better understand whether they've even accepted the condition that they have. If they don't have, if they're not accepting it, if they don't believe it belongs to them, then they're going to probably put it in your lap and ask you for a solution. And there may not be a solution. It may just be something that they need to learn to take ownership of and go down the path 
of implementing these these techniques and these strategies and these ideas so that they can better manage it. And so I think those are really important things. If they use their own ruler, they understand their capabilities, they understand their limitations, and then they can take the information that you're providing them and they can put it to constructive use. But I have spent time with chronic pain patients who haven't even accepted their condition. They each and every time they go to a provider, they're expecting that provider to cure them. Unlike my co-panelists up here, I don't believe there is a cure for my condition. I, it's mine, it will forever be there, but I've committed myself to working with it and managing it and empowering myself using techniques and strategies so that I can go about a new life. It's different, it's not what I used to do. I'm a private pilot, I can't fly my plane anymore. There are many things that I had once uh, done in my in my life and career that are different. So I'm not gonna cry over spilt milk, that's part of the CBT, where you can over time become your own analyst. You're not sitting with you know, a 24 hour a day uh, caregiver who's telling you no, those aren't the right thoughts. So you become your own, your own therapist and you can help yourself through just about anything. The brain's very, very powerful. And even though you do have significant limitations, if you're committed and motivated and you own the condition that you find yourself with, then I think you can find solutions, but you have to do it on your own terms. Yeah, wonderful, thanks Mark. And Joe, you, in, in, as part of your recovery, and I've known you for four years now, so it's, it's been really interesting to watch you come along that journey. So from that point where you really were at the turning point and, um, and how you, just even in the last year, are now identifying less as being a person with chronic pain and someone who's moved through that. That's been quite um, wonderful to watch. And also, the way that you're able to articulate that gives us a lot more information, and that's your value as a, as a blogger. Um, I think that's, that's wonderful. You really embraced, essentially, what we'd say an ACT approach, and you tapped into values and purpose, particularly purpose, and that really helped your recovery. And you were doing a lot of volunteer work and, uh, and, and bigger picture stuff. Can you talk to us a bit about that, about how that helped your recovery? Yeah, so sort of like Mark accidentally did CBT on himself, I kind of accidentally did ACT on myself, <laughs> ACT. Um, and for me, acceptance <clears throat> was also a big part of things, because I had, I had resisted for so long the state that I was in because I wanted to go back. I wanted to go back to my former life and being the firefighter and doing all of those things. And, um, but you can't go back. So <clears throat> for me, acceptance was just about with accepting where I was at at that current moment and all of those things that had happened and all of the changes that had taken place, both in my life and in myself, um, which is a hard thing to do. Like you. It's, it's a, definitely a process and an ongoing one. It's like a daily kind of thing to, to go through that process. But being able to do that, to accept what had happened, to accept where I was, to accept that pain was a part of my, my daily existence, um, and to make some space for it, allowed me to make space for everything else that was kind of meaningful to me and that mattered to me and that I really wanted to get back to. Those, things that I loved, the people that I loved and that loved me and the experiences that I wanted to have again, like travel and snowboarding and hiking and, and all of these different things. Um, so having that little bit of space and also having a new understanding of pain and not being so worried about injury and damage and that with every step I took, I was doing more harm to myself um, or messing stuff up in my hip again. Um, like bit by bit got to get back to those things that I really valued and and that mattered to me and and that's a process too and it's something that I'm grateful for grateful for in retrospect because it really made me identify those things that matter to me you know the people in my life that really matter to me the experiences that really matter to me and I got rid of all the bullshit like like I don't need all this excess because I don't have enough space for it right now I have this very limited kind of um, existence that's gradually expanding, but there's no room for all that fluff. And um, But identifying those things that are really meaningful and give your life value and purpose, I feel like are so important for so many reasons, not just as a distraction, but just it, it 
begins to help you redefine who you are and realize that you've been there all along or just hidden by this pain for a while. Like, it took me a long time to realize that I wasn't who I was because I had been a firefighter, that I had been a firefighter because of who I was as a person. Um, and, and that realization was, was huge for me. Mm. Thank you, that's great. And Erin, your husband has been by your side from the get-go with this condition. Um, and he's obviously been through the ups and downs and in your story, you mention him a lot and what he was going through and what his thoughts were about that. Can, do you have any insights about how, how, what the carer's journey is or what, what the other half's journey is along that, um, along that pathway? Yeah, um, I mean, he's like my hero. Him and my physical therapist are, um, I think when you and I spoke at one point, you asked like who carried me through and it was him um, for often, years. Often literally. Yeah, quite, yeah. quite literally. Yeah. I mean, he's lifted me off the toilet when I couldn't feel my legs, things like that. I mean, mm. quite literally. Um, and he carried me through. And when I met my physical therapist, she was uh, finally able to alleviate some of that burden from him, um, which I think was really powerful. He ended up actually, shortly after I met her, a few months after I met her, um, he ended up taking a job out of state, and I was like, I don't know how to, how to like exist anymore. I mean, unlike both of you who talked about getting back to who you were or reconciling with your new reality, I didn't know who I was. I was 19 when my pain started. Um, I had no idea who I was. Um, my life had been defined and marked by pain, and my husband and I had been together since I was 23. So, I mean, I just had no earthly idea what I liked, uh, who my friends were, what, what I wanted out of life. Um, so it was really, he took a job out of state and it was sort of like me and my PT were like, okay, like it's us now. <laughs> um, and I think that was a really incredible role that she played and sort of, he finally felt like somebody was looking out for me. And so I think that, would have been so beneficial earlier on um, if we felt like we had more reinforcements. Um, it would have been really helpful, but it was an extremely arduous journey for him and for both of us and for our relationship. We dealt with stuff that none of our friends were dealing with. Nobody in their 20s dealt with this stuff. Um, and it was every aspect of our lives. I mean, some of my illness occurred pre-Obamacare, so I'm still paying off about 60000 in medical debt because I was dumped by my insurance. Um, so, I mean, that isn't something that most people in their 20s have. I mean, we postponed and canceled a wedding because of it. So, I mean, the degree to which my pain impacted his life was astounding and is difficult to even convey. And we recently spent some time with my father-in-law, his dad, and we're talking to him about the realities of what our experience was during that time, and he was really shocked. Like, he, he hadn't realized just how horrific this time was, and he was saying that he just so admired our relationship because we came out the other end of it, and we've sort of re sorted out who we are. I'm a completely different person than I was when he met me almost 10 years ago. Um, I have different interests and virtually everything about me is different. Um, <laughs> I can't think of anything that's, my hair color is the same, I think. Um, but other than that, I think everything's different. So I think it was his ability to be resilient in terms of accepting who I was as I changed through that process and then us being able to shift roles and as soon as I was healthy enough at all um, to be able to support him and encourage him to pursue things that he was interested in, to pursue his career, to pursue everything that he had pushed by the wayside to support me for a long time because the sacrifices caregivers make are astounding. I mean, just mm -hmm. astounding. So. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to hand it over to the audience now. We've got about 15 minutes for questions. So I wonder if there's any audience uh, questions from the audience that you have for our panel. Uh, thank you very much. I'm 
very grateful for you sharing that. Uh, Joletta, my question's for you. You spoke about the just almost universal impact that this had on every area of your life and your identity and your relationships and your work and all of those things. And, <clears throat> excuse me, so when, when uh, what would be your advice to, to me as a practitioner if a, a client comes, because I have some clients who have that experience and they're, you know, they're not sleeping, they're not working, they've, their relationships are failing, you know, everything's just going to hell in a handbasket. So how do you start to un, un, unravel that? How do you start to tease that out and, and where, do you, where do you start? So I, I think it all starts with just being a compassionate presence, you know. One of, when I was the patient demo here last year with Peter O'Sullivan, the first thing he said to me was, tell me your story. And I asked him where I should begin. And he said, wherever you want. And, and that was such a profound thing for me because nobody had ever asked me that before. I mean, if anyone follows my blog, you know I tell my story all the time. But no one had ever asked me for it before. And... It, and I was even surprised at where I went with it. And I went back to that most salient feature of my past. And, and I was so fearful that I was going to go back to that. But he didn't necessarily have to tease out like how all of those aspects were affecting my pain. He just had to listen to it. And, and I could start connecting my own dots and realizing, oh my gosh, like this stuff is affecting my pain. But I think that so much of it just starts with listening. And, and like everyone, has said like we've had empathetic and kind practitioners but but never felt really heard um and i think that it's a skill it's it's really hard to just sit and listen and to not want to jump in and fix or get to the problem like get to the heart of it and i don't know that you can ever like say oh this is the thing that's driving this person's pain because it's so big and it's so complex and the longer they've been living with it, the more their life has been affected, the more their relationships have been affected, their careers, their identities. Um, we c I lost so much during that time, including my career, our financial security. Like we really struggled with that too. Our relationship also suffered for it. My husband and I didn't really talk for two years. Like for, for two years, I didn't know how to ask for help and he didn't know how to help, so we just were silent about it. Um, and that's not something a physical therapist or a manual therapist is going to fix. But being that compassionate presence, and if someone is open to telling that story, wants to tell that story, to just hear it, believe them, validate them, you know, tell them like, that sounds like it was really difficult to go through. And let's see what we can do to help you move forward together. Let's work on this and, and create this plan together to get you on a different path. Does that, did that answer your question? Thank you. <laughs> Hi, thank you. This was really valuable, so thank you for um, sharing that. I, I'm wondering what was that point, you all spoke of your light bulb moments. Um, Mr. Moore said it was engaging in activities. Joletta mentioned it was um, your interview with Laura Mosley, and you um, was, I'm guessing, Dr. Oz when you first heard the word, <laughs> yeah. and, and then a few other things. I'm wondering what was that moment that you were able to say, um, I no longer have chronic pain, where, you, where it was like, I feel like I have this, because I imagine that could be a really, like I would, yeah. Um, so it depends on the day still, I would okay. say. Um, so I don't have like, I didn't have like an official discharge date from PT. Um, my PT had suggested at one point that I no longer needed to see her twice a week. I could go to once a week and I like melted down a little bit and she was like, no, 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 no you're good. Just twice a week's fine. Um, <laughs> and waited for me to take the lead and then like a few months later I'm like okay well my schedule next week is kind of busy so I could do once a week um, and then that sort of trickled off and at one point she said okay well when do you want to come in next week and I'm like I think I'm good um, 
Except the really cool thing has been that she, so she really emphasizes graded exposure. So I have throughout the course of PT really taken on a lot of new activities and experiences. So like one example was I wanted to do yoga and be like all my friends when I started PT. I couldn't wear underwear or pants or like walk, so I <laughs> had a while to go. Um, but at some point after some PT, um, her and her business partner, uh, who happens to be a yoga teacher, decided that they were going to like create this plan to get Aaron back to yoga um, that Aaron was not exactly on board with. So I kept like putting it off you know, they were saying like, do yoga at the clinic. No, 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 I don't have time today, I can't do it. I can't wear underwear, I'm still in a skirt. Um, so I came in one day and they made a, I was in for PT, I think I told you this story. Um, and they made like a fort for me. Um, they hung sheets like over chairs and made like a privacy shield thing. Um, and did like 10 minutes of yoga with me and then like, you know, laid me down in Shavasana and were like so complimentary, like, you did awesome, you're awesome at yoga. Um, I was like, yeah. Uh, and so then, you know, I'm sure I updated my Facebook status to like, just did yoga today, like gonna go get some coffee now, like trying to feel normal. Um, and then that sort of, I wanted to do yoga again, but like this was kind of a production, so the next time I came in, um, my PT's lovely business partner presented me with these like purple Thai massage pants um, that are like huge, okay, they're really big. They're like one size fits all times two, so they're intended for flexiness. Um, and I was 45 pounds lighter than I am now at the time. I was really emaciated from like all my drugs and not walking and all of that. So she presented me with these bright purple pants and was like, try these on, you could do yoga in these. Um, and it was the first time I had pants on in like three years and it was awesome. So then I did yoga that day wearing these like bright purple fisherman pants and I did for like six months I think um, until finally I was able to wear regular yoga pants and then I started doing yoga at the clinic like three days a week and I did that for about a year until I finally had the confidence to go to a class not at the clinic um, and now I don't go to classes at the clinic hardly at all. Um, I do hot yoga like five days a week um, and can stand on my head and am almost able to do the splits. I'm like eight inches away. But my point is to your question, I injure myself continuously and <laughs> I push myself too hard because I'm enjoying being active and feeling normal. And I end up back in my PT's office on her table um, complaining that my hips hurt or that I'm scared that my pain is back. Um, and so I definitely appreciate, she still reassures me, this is not that my pain is back, this is that like I practiced my headstands like 50 times yesterday and fell, I fell a few months ago on the hardwood floor, um, which is not smart anyway, but hit my hip and was so worried that my pain was back. And so it's it depends on the day and it depends on the activity and that has been a really hard lesson. And I've asked her more times than I can count like when I'll know it'll be gone and she has said, we don't know yet how many positive experiences you have to have before you'll be assured that it's not gonna come back and I still don't know like where that balance is um, and so I think it's really hard but it's the ongoing reassurance that I'm okay and that the door's always open and the supported independence of we're always gonna be here so go out, be adventurous, do really stupid stuff and we'll still be here. And I think that has empowered me to feel normal, if that makes sense. We've probably got time for just one more question. Okay. Oh, okay, good, excellent. Thank you, ask the man. <laughs> Okay, thanks so much for your talks. I, I, it was really greatly needed, I think. I think it just reiterates the importance of listening to people in pain, listening to your narrative. The, the thing that struck me was across all three of you, there seems to be a theme that was emerging, which was empowerment. And I, I always think there's a dilemma with empowerment, which is, as a clinician, to empower other people, you have to be prepared to lose power. 
you've got to be prepared to say, okay, I, I know all this stuff, but I'm going to hand it over to you. You have the answers, not me. So on reflection from your experiences, what advice would you give to clinicians to drop the power, to get, hand over the power to you? And what advice would you give to other people in pain to maybe try and take some power back? What, what, did, you, what did you learn about? What was that first step for you taking the power back? I'll add a really quick comment, and that's being willing to refer out to other providers if you're not the right provider for that person, either because of a personality thing or an expertise thing, um, that a really good way to let your, your power or your guard down is to really critically assess whether you're the best person to help that patient and remember that your modality is not the modality that's going to help everybody and that's the beauty in a variety of professional experiences and expertise and stuff because I felt like that was one of the things that was preventing me from being empowered in my treatment because I wasn't in treatment with the right people but didn't know who else to go to so I felt like if they had help transition me to someone else, then maybe that would have been a better fit and would have empowered me to take a more active role in my recovery. I'll say a quick thing too, and then I'll give it to you, Mark, if that's sure. okay. Um, I think that like one, one critical thing to recognize is I don't think that healthcare practitioners realize how much agency they're stealing from their patients. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is, and especially if you're not developing that relationship at the start where, where you're listening to the patient and they're feeling heard and believed because that establishes trust. And if that trust isn't established, then why are they gonna comply with anything that you ask them to do? Um, they, for them to have buy-in and be empowered to move forward, they have to be a part of the process. And often they're not a part of the process. And that's something that needs to be front-loaded and changed. Um, and that requires just sitting back and listening and shutting up sometimes and just just figuring out what their goals are. I've written a, a post about like whose, goal are, whose goals are they? Are they the therapist's goals or are they per, the person in pain's goals? Because usually they're the therapist's goals that we're trying to achieve. And that needs to be flipped too because it's the person living with pain that is living with that pain every single day it's their lives that are affected it's their lives that are the one that are moving forward and they need to be able to to handle whatever comes at them if they flare up they need to be empowered to with some skills and some strategies to navigate through that because they don't have a psychologist with them 24 hours a day or their physical therapist with them 24 hours a day um, if they want to feel empowered enough to travel, they have to, they have to feel confident enough in their ability to manage their situation to be able to do that. Um, so I think that that listening part first, that establishing trust, um, will ensure greater compliance to whatever that therapeutic path is forward because they then are a part of that path. I'll, I'll expand on a couple of areas. First, the listening. I agree that that's a critical component. You've got empathy, you're, sh you're, you're empathizing with your patient and you're listening. But it's also important, since it's a two-way street, that they listen to you, the provider. And oftentimes, I'm not sure that, that it, there is a two-way street. I'm not sure it's 100% incumbent upon you to just do all of the listening. Because if you're listening and you're beginning to evaluate what, where they are in their pain journey, if they're not listening to you and they have some other expectation, I think it becomes very difficult for you to have a program or a pathway for them um, because they're just perhaps looking to you to solve their problem and it's not something you're gonna be able to do. So honesty, it's the second component. You need to be honest with them what your capabilities are and what their expectations should be, and they need to be honest with you as to what they expect you to provide. I think if those are there in the first few sessions that you're having with your, with your patient, I think you'll get off to a much more constructive start, and I think as you begin to establish uh, uh, levels of progress and what outcomes could be, you'll both walk away with a better understanding of what you can expect from the other. They need to know what they can expect from you, and you need to know what you can expect from them. Remember, I spoke about commitment and, 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 and their motivation. 
if you're providing them with exercises or things that they need to do when they're not in your office, you need to know that they're committed to do that. If they don't even believe that they are responsible for their condition, that's not likely to happen and you're just going to end up getting blamed. Thanks so much. I'm so glad to see a patient panel um, out there. It may, makes, makes my heart sing. Um, I would like to involve you, Alison, in the conversation when we talk about clinicians and how we can put ourselves into people's stories. So I know as a clinician I am infinitely better for the amount of reading I've done of Joletta's blog, particularly. And if, you're not, if you haven't read it, I would say study it. And I think it's really as important for us to be able to sit with the fact that we don't, we don't know what chronic pain is like. And like we learned from, Dr. from Professor Abkarian this morning, we, the experience of acute pain and chronic pain are just not anything similar. But if we're going to work in this area, we need to understand and be able to put ourselves into that role. So I consider reading blogs and reading people's stories and, and even and outside of the clinic where we can be reflective and actually put ourselves into that place, different from hearing a story in a clinical setting where we have to do something with it. So I wonder if you have any um, advice for us as clinicians about resources that we might use or ways to, to find more stories and develop that sense of being able to sit in, in the other person's position. That's a good question. Uh, I think certainly just from personal experience as a, as a clinician, um, I've been back in practice for seven months now and I've, I've certainly uh, gone into that journey with with the idea of wanting to listen more and, and taking that approach. So I set myself a challenge in December of, uh, at work of when I was sitting with a patient, could I just ask, tell me your story and then sit back? And, and how long could I let that go on with just very gentle, gentle directions that allowed the patient and trusting that the patient knows the answer, that they're gonna give you the information that's pertinent to them. Um, and that's pertinent to the case. And, the, it, you know, the, the rest of the history stuff, for those chronic cases, by the time they've come that far along the journey, you, you want to get your red flags, but they're unlikely to be there. They've seen absolutely everyone before they've got to your, your, your um, desk. Um, and, and really, the, the rest of the semantics that we might be looking for in a history, they're probably not as important as what that patient is wanting to tell you. So that was my challenge for December, and I found it really, really tricky. I, I, encourage you to give it a go. <laughs> um, I, I'm a bit lucky, I, I have more extended consults, so I have the luxury of doing that. But you could do the same thing in an informal setting when the patient's on the table. So, and, and I've certainly heard um, some horrendous stories, horrendous, horrendous stories in that, in that time um, of people who um, are in pain and have gone through the most extraordinary circumstances. And, and, um, and again, part of that challenge was to see if I could really put myself in their shoes and say, you know, could this have been me, or what, how would I feel if I was in that? And um, I think as Mark was saying yesterday, working with that idea that if you can really understand the patient, that's going to change the trajectory of every part of that consult. If you really get where they're coming from, and it's going to change every facet of that consultation, particularly your enthusiasm to help them. Um, so that's that's one way, and, and certainly um, I, I see it as a need to understand people's narratives and people's journeys, and um, and I see it as a need for patients as well. So I think I've discussed with with you, Lysanthia, that I'm, I'm writing a book, and all three of these good people are, are going to be included in that, which is about uh, patient <coughs> stories and and patients who have had pain who've gone on to to live well, and what was it about that? What was it about that journey that? turned around and what were their thoughts around that? So for that patient who's sitting in, in the consult and thinking, oh, this, this is not for me, my pain's actually in my hip, um, I don't want to talk about this bigger picture stuff, to hear that people have had exactly those same thoughts, exactly the same feelings, um, but kind of did it anyway or, or something worked for them that made them take that next step and then this is where it went. Um, I think that, that it, perhaps I see it as a bit of a gap in the, uh, in the market, so that's my uh, pet project for 2018. Hi. Uh, we have one question from a virtual attendee, Victoria Matzer, and she, she already knows about Joletta's blog, I think, but she wants to know if Aaron and Mark also have a blog. 
Yep, um, I started about a year ago a nonprofit called Inspire Sante, uh, Inspire Health it means, uh, oriented towards awareness around pelvic pain. Um, and that's inspiresante.org. Um, and it's been really awesome. I get emails from women around the world, uh, literally around the world, sharing their pelvic pain stories with me and saying that they finally like found something that resonated with them and echoed their experience. So um, yeah. That's where I share my stuff. I don't have a blog. Most of my time over the last few years since being introduced to the uh, concepts of pain management have been in class settings. I'm now beginning to uh, become more involved in situations like this. I was also a participant last year in the pain summit. So perhaps moving forward. Uh, my, uh, my focus has been on actually interacting with other pain patients. There's a lot that we can get from one another. We can learn a lot. We can also help. I've wor I, I had the uh, occasion to uh, be chosen to work in a, um, uh, work with a personal trainer along with a few other people. We've got a free gym membership, et cetera. It was wonderful. Our medical provider provided that. One of the persons that uh, I, I was involved with had just never accepted his condition. So it really didn't matter what they provided. For him, it was, he was putting them on trial each and every time. So I had the opportunity, because apparently somewhere along the line, that was missed with all of the number of providers and people who had been writing prescriptions, that had been missed. Each and every time he met a new provider, he just put them on trial waiting for them to solve his problem. And he had gradually, he had degraded over a period of a number of years and his expectation was he was, going to be, he was going to be cured. So I had the opportunity as another pain patient to give him my perspective and I think that really helped him and that's where I've spent my energies working with others who perhaps haven't found that pathway, they haven't found that aha moment and I've tried to help guide them to that and I think I've been helpful there. We have time. Fantastic. May, Let's, may uh, a, a, a please, thing? please, yeah. As I listen to the providers asking questions, there's one piece of information that um, I would offer. There's, there's one item that all pain patients, one question we hear every single time we meet a provider, and that question is, on a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being the least, 10 being the most, what's your current level of pain? And for the life of me, I don't understand why that question is asked. I don't understand it. What is the point? All you're doing is focusing that patient back onto pain. And you all know what condition the response is. Eventually, you're going to get what you're looking for. I think perhaps a better question would be, given your current level of discomfort, what, if anything, will that affect in your daily routine today? Now, if there is no impact, or they're going to have to sit down one additional time, or maybe they're going to have to take another 20-minute break, I believe that's important information for you, the provider, instead of a number of four or six or whatever it is. And you know it's always a big number, but there, my, my interpretation of pain, my six, is probably not your six. So I'm not really sure the point and why it's used. And, that would be just a tip that I would offer. Thanks, Mark. We'll, um, we'll, I'll, uh, I'll book Mark up to come and teach in my uh, courses later this year. Thank you. <laughs> Very valuable insights. Could we have the other panel, the other panelists, expand on that? Oh yeah, yeah. I never got it either. Um, I mean, I always gave an answer, but. The, especially when you've been in pain for a really long time and that becomes your new normal, then, then, then what does that become? Because um, you're what living with it, what does it mean, does yeah. It mean? And, and throughout the day it's gonna fluctuate. Like my mornings used to be really, really hard. It would take me 20 minutes just to get out of bed and get my, my feet on the floor. And then it was going to the living room to lay down on the floor. My pain would be through the roof, but that by the time I got to the clinic and was moving a little bit, it would be different. So I'm like, do you want my pain when I woke up this morning, or do you want my pain right now, or what it was yesterday? And is any of that relevant? Because you're removing the entire context of this pain experience to a number at this moment in time that is bereft of any useful 
information, in my opinion. For the patient. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I completely agree. I've never understood it. And yeah, I mean, and I've been hospitalized several times for stuff relating to my pain. And um, they're like obsessed with it in the hospital where they ask you continuously. And it was, it, it yeah, I mean, it doesn't make any difference. I, I really ratchet, I latched onto it when um, you only have to get dropped from insurance once to realize they care about like objective metrics like that. So I did do some research years ago and knew the levels of pain decreasing that I needed to report to ensure that I continued to get coverage, mm -hmm. but that I wasn't doing, so I wasn't doing too well to not have it be medically necessary anymore, but I was doing well enough that it wasn't a long-term care insurance situation, which I didn't have. So um, then I would report levels of pain simply out of self-preservation to ensure that the insurance claims reflected the right information. But it had nothing to do with my experience. I mean, my experience was subjective. So, yeah. I have a question. As a mother and caregiver of a 16-year-old who has sickness and pain every day. What do you suggest for a caregiver to show compassion, to not enable, to have gone down that road of so many therapists and doctors and she says, I can't live my life until I'm fixed. And I can come here and I can listen to all this, but she wants to be fixed. I understand that. I wanted, I wanted my pain to go away. I didn't have any barometer of what life was supposed to be like without pain. That was the only reality I knew. Um, and it was the empathy and the ability. Um, it was my husband's empathy, his patience, his willingness to listen to the same story time and again, his advocacy of me. Um, I was hospitalized one time and was in the emergency room and was so, I was having an allergic reaction, no medication, and was like vomiting and so sick. And somebody came into the emergency room holding, of all things, a stack of Domino's pizzas. And he like walked up to them and was like, you need to get those away from her. And I mean, that level of advocacy made me feel so much safer. I felt like I had someone looking out for me. And so I felt like to the extent that was possible, like I could, relax and cope with my reality because someone was watching out for me. But I also think, like, aside from being empathetic and patient and supportive and all things, you know, pouring all of the household and family's resources into it, at the end of the day, you can't take it away either, which I think was one of the hardest things for him, too, that he wanted to just take it away. And so I, I think that there's not a, or I don't have a magic answer, but I think it's, it's about showing up every day and also self-care for you because it's a, an absolutely grueling role to play. Um, so. And Erin, ultimately it was your husband who pushed you to take that, that final step and find the PT when you had almost given up, hadn't you? You had yeah. completely lost faith yeah. that anyone was ever going to be able to help you and he, his consistency was that last final step that was the answer for you. His faith that I would yeah. recover made a big difference because I lost that. My PT who ultimately saved me, um, I went to see her to check the box to say that I was doing everything I could but I had long given up any hope that I was going to recover mm. and I went and saw her and she had different ideas about how to do things and was talking to me about pain science and I was like, like, do you not have like needles or like nerve blocks or, I mean, I had just like been through the ringer mm -hmm. and he talked me into going to see her again and he said, he like pulled her aside at the beginning of the appointment and was like, you're going to be able to help her, right? Um, <laughs> and she was like, uh, if I can't, I'll get her to someone who can and I think that continuing to push me and to say like, I know you don't think you're going to get better, but this isn't your life. This is not going to be your life. And I don't know how you're going to recover, but I promise you this is not going to be your life. And, and my daughter would listen to your story and say, see, it took her 10 years. We need to keep looking. But my God, but it shouldn't at, have taken me 10 years. At what point I mean, do you stop going to you the don't. doctors? You, you don't. You can't, I think. That's what I was going to say too. 
I think, well, I was just going to add too, like just loving and being loved. Like that's, that part is so important and it's so hard. It, and it's so hard when you're in that much pain to feel like you're lovable because you don't, you, you change as a person and you're, you don't feel like yourself. And it's, it's such a hard place to be. And you don't, you don't, f well, for me, I shouldn't speak for everybody, but I didn't feel like I was of worth anymore and that I was just a burden. I was only a burden to my husband and to my family and my friends. And I didn't feel worthy of love and that support and that, you know, time and care because it is so hard on the carers. It's so hard. Um, so that continual love and support and having those open, honest, you know, conversations, the hard conversations that are really difficult to have. That my husband and I avoided for two years, but when we finally had them, we got like being able to fully express yourself and, and express the amount of pain that you're in and then come up with practical strategies like as a family of what that means. So if I'm having a really bad pain day, what do I need from him or what do I need from my family? And then the family too, being able to express how much this is affecting them as well, because we all try to try to be stoic and say, I am the strong one and I have to show my strength. Well, sometimes that that comes off as they don't care or they're, um, they don't believe me. They don't believe how much pain that I'm in. And for, for us, like we came to that conclusion that he couldn't fix me and that I didn't need him to fix me, that I needed him to fix dinner. Like those very practical <laughs> things um, and that you don't give up hope. Like there's, but it's gotta be a realistic hope that mm -hmm. there's that, and it's that accepting this moment while continuing to try to move forward with the things that you can do and seeking what those solutions, other solutions might be. Because I, I firmly believe that things can change for everybody. Um, but, and it's such a fine balance and it's just about figuring out what that is, there's definitely no answer, but love, I think, is such a big solution to all of that. Uh, you're in a difficult situation because as a parent, of course, we have a tendency to want to fix what's wrong with our children and their lives, and we don't want them to experience pain and discomfort and things like that. Unfortunately, though, um, it may not be something you can fix. And the best thing I think you can do is to steer, it's your daughter, steer her towards the tools that she can use, such as CBT. I don't think it's an age specific thing where she She's can. She's been through four years of counseling and I have brought her to some of the most best programs. So it's like, evidently she has not met that person that has turned her light on yet. Mm. Yeah, one of the, let me add something here that I'll put, just maybe it'll put it in a better uh, context for you from where I'm coming from. When, when I ended up in, with my condition, you know, all of my children and family, they were swarming around, and I've been in absolute excruciating moments where I'm in complete and absolute shutdown. And so the first thing they're compelled to do is start asking questions. What's wrong? What can I do? What's happening? The best thing they could do is to just sit there and not say anything, because that's putting me in a position of having to answer them and start thinking now about them, and I should be thinking about what I need to do to work through this very difficult moment. And if they will just surround me and be there and show their empathy and their love, then as I move through that moment, then we can get back to uh, interaction with each other. And, and the person who's, who carries the chronic pain has to learn to cope with it. They, they have to adopt tools and explore techniques that are gonna help them manage it. Because in many cases, mine being one of them, it's never gonna go away. It's just something I have to learn to do. Exercise is tremendous. It builds your endurance. It, in, in, in addition to the obvious, it distracts your mind. It allows you to endure that level of pain that you wouldn't otherwise be able to manage as well if you were just sitting in a chair. Or if you had, in my mind, somebody sitting there absorbing or trying to make your pain less. I think it's something that she 
would have to process. You can be there to support her, but I think the tools are ultimately what's going to give her the ability to work through it. And I've taken that route now that I can't fix her pain, and then it's her begging me to take it away, and then I don't care for her anymore. You don't. <laughs> yeah, so it's just a, it's a tough. It's difficult. And when you go in the, me in the mental health world, you know, as a parent, it's like um, enabling. You don't want to enable her, and you don't. It's like, yeah, what do you... You're Are so, you talking so about the stigma of mental health? No, as no? a parent, yes. As a, in mental health, there's so much judgment. And that's <laughs> unfortunate. That's another thing where I was talking earlier about the ruler, your life ruler, your child. I don't know what the age of your daughter is, but, mm -hmm. you know, I think... But not enable people with pain, so not be doing everything for her. Right. You know, and letting her sit in her own pain and figure out what that is that she needs to do, and for me to be able to it's, let that happen. It's her condition, and yes. unfortunately, like I said earlier, I'm not sure you can fix it. No. And, and as mental health goes, I, I think all providers should be an advocate of mental health. I think every person could benefit from having sessions with a psychologist or a psychiatrist for any reason, not just chronic pain. And, it, and, and it's unfortunate, because I have friends, too, that say, well, no, no, you don't need to do that. I, I refer to them as well-meaning third parties. They mean well. <laughs> but the advice they give is based on their lives, not mine. Mm -hmm. And so eventually you just kind of say, you know, I appreciate it. You know, I know you care. But that's the most important thing is that you care. Mm -hmm. I can't just stop doing what I'm doing because my life's not yours. It's, we're, not, we're not the same. Thank you so much. That's an incredibly tough, tough situation, and I'm sure our panel members might be happy to chat to you further afterwards. We've got time for just one more question, and then we'll wrap it up. So this question may apply to all three. I know it applied to to Joletta, um, and it comes from my experience working in a behemoth health system that is largely disability based. And I wonder what kind of other barriers you, any of you, have gone through in trying to reconcile wanting to be well and demonstrate, demonstrating to yourself how you can be better and live better when you may also have to demonstrate illness. I mean, Erin, you spoke to it a little bit. Um, but that's a conversation that I have to have with patients a lot, more than I'd like to, um, is even if, so the willingness and motivation is really difficult when financial ties are also dependent on illness or disability. Um, so I just wonder if there's, I mean, there's so, so many nuances that maybe healthcare providers aren't aware are going on in the background that might sabotage somebody's full investment in the process. Well, I'll, I'll share just a couple of things, and I have no solutions, um, but I'll share all the problems. <laughs> so <laughs> um, being, there's so many barriers, I feel like. I was in the workers' compensation system, which is a little bit different. So my care was tied into being able to prove that something was wrong. Like, not, not even just finances, like my actual care, like being able to see a clinician. Um, and my initial five months, I was still working full duty, but was losing function over time. And then it's like once you go off work, the whole, the rules all change. And... I'm not sure if it's the same everywhere, but there's an investigative process and all this red tape that, that happens within the workers' compensation system where you feel as a patient that you're being investigated, like your, your character and your morality is essentially being investigated before you're treated for whatever condition that you have. Um, I was going through my paperwork the other day. I went through spans of five to six months at a time where I had no care whatsoever as I was waiting for approvals and, and processes. Um, and then tied in with that too, which is going to be, um, which might be difficult things for some of your patients to reconcile on our paperwork for, well, and I worked in a very physical profession too, but our paperwork has all these very specific no's, all these things that you cannot do. So you, I could not run, I could not climb, I could not be in awkward positions. Like that's pretty, like what does that mean? Um, I couldn't lift more than 10 pounds. I couldn't um, 
sit for longer than 20 minutes. Like I had all these rules that were written in my paperwork. So if I break those rules, that my claim is at risk, which means my care is then at risk. So I could do those things in the clinic, but then I, when I went home, I, I can't go out of, my cell, out of my house and do it, because then what if an investigator sees me and I'm breaking the rules on my no paperwork, and then my claim is at risk for that. Um, and I've talked with other, other patients, other people who work for my fire department who have those same fears. A mother of two who is trying desperately to get better after she has pelvic pain, um, and she's terrified to take her kids to the park because she doesn't want to get caught by the system. And those things are so heartbreaking and such systemic problems that are really going to affect that person on so many levels, their ability to engage with the world, their ability to go out and exercise. Um, and also those things start to become a part of your belief system about yourself. You know, I can't run. Like no running, that means I can't run. I can't squat, I can't climb, I can't do these things. Like I am somehow medically prevented from doing these things. And they become a part of your belief system about your capabilities. So there's, there's so much there. I mean, that could be a whole weekend's worth of things to talk about, but I have no, that needs to be fixed at multiple levels. So one of the things I've written a bunch of blog posts about is how sick I got of hearing, but you don't look sick. Um, because my pain wasn't visible to anyone except all the providers that were continuously looking for it, and even then not visible. Um, but I was continuously told I didn't look sick, so going out and engaging with the world was made so stressful. Um, when I lived in uh, New Mexico, I flew every week to Colorado for medical treatment um, for PT, and I was in horrific pain, and so I always asked for help, like, to pre-board the plane and for help with my bag, and I was denied several times, um, which is incredible to me now, looking back, um, that I would be denied, as if I were taking advantage of a system. Um, I occasionally brought my dog, who I had medical documentation for, with me to treatment. I was getting sometimes four hours of treatment, staying the night and getting four hours more of treatment the next day. It was excruciatingly painful. This was something that helped alleviate some of the stress of it. Routinely told that the documentation was somehow not okay, stopped in the middle of the airport by employees, you have to put that pet in a bag. I mean, like, I had all the documentation um, being yelled at in parking lots for using uh, disabled parking spaces, um, yelled at by strangers that I was not disabled and what was I doing. And so just the, I started sort of like feigning, without it being intentional, feigning like a limp when I would get out of my car because I wanted to not be yelled at. It was so stressful. And I, I wrote a blog post about this because by the time I finally made it to the physical therapist who helped me, I actually walked with a limp, like I was limping around because it was like a protective mechanism to get people to stop like being just horrific human beings to me in public. And I didn't realize that that was like, that undercurrent was there. It was a really horrible experience. So I think there's so many hurdles. Because that just made me think of another thing too. Another like you're you're in all this horrific pain, and you do one thing that is fun. You know, you meet a friend for coffee or something like that, and then that goes on social media, and then everyone's like, "Oh, they're they're fine now, they're better." And and those hurdles are another huge hurdle too. Where where when you're in that position, you're constantly feeling like you have to explain and defend yourself. You're constantly having to like seek validation and, and belief from people. And it just gets exhausting and that's why your world becomes so small. You just don't want to engage with the world anymore because it sucks out there when, when you're in that much pain and people don't see it and then also don't believe it when you share it with them. I'll just add a little bit. You know, those two things really are in conflict with one another. On this side, you've got providers, you've got doctors, clinicians, and providers encouraging their chronic pain patients to engage and to, and they're empowering them with additional tools and information so that they can go out and build their endurance and, and 
manage the condition that they have. And then on the other side, those that typically make decisions about your qualifications of either your disability or your health care or whatever it may be are saying it's exactly those things you're doing that indicate to me that you don't have the disability that you said you had. And I understand that's a very difficult place to be. But I think the solution comes with things like this, where you've got a pain summit that brings practitioners together to better understand chronic pain, not only how to treat and empower your patient, but also start to filter that back to some of the decision makers that are just looking at a piece of paper. Maybe it's the items on the piece of paper that will ultimately change, where it's no longer so subjective that because this person bent over and picked up a ball while they were on the beach was some indication that they were no longer in, in pain. It may have been at that moment they were able to engage in that activity, but who knows what the price was that they paid when they got home and how many hours that they had to deal with that. So I understand it's a real difficult situation. I don't have an absolute solution, but I think the solution comes from more and more people participating in events and recognizing it, that it is real. The last thing I would want a pain patient as a friend or someone I'm working with to do is misrepresent themselves. That one to 10, for example. If you have to tell somebody you're at a level eight to qualify, I'm not sure that's beneficial. I don't think it's healthy. Because if you're willing to do that, then what are you willing to do next? And so in many cases, as I heard earlier, you kind of feel forced to do that. So maybe it's just some over the course of time and through continued education, we'll find some of those changes. In my own experience, my own health provider has made dramatic changes in the last 10 years to focus on and provide for chronic pain patients. Mm. It's a good sign. Things are changing. Thank you. Some very beautiful insights and some very positive stories. Um, our panel will be around today and I'm sure they'll be happy to take some more of your questions. Um, and it's wonderful to see that we are, uh, we are taking, we're, we're paying attention to the, the patients and the patient stories and just how important that is for us as practitioners. So thank you for your time. I'll hand back to Jason. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your insights. Okay, we've got a little less than 15 minutes break, and then when we come back, Mark Cargella will be up here. So please uh, hit, the, hit the restroom or whatever you need to do, and we look forward to seeing you very shortly. <laughs>